you can see when it's gone live when it goes here. Hi guys, thanks for joining. This is Essence of History. Today we're talking about the laws in Iran versus in the U.S. I'm Amanda Armagost. I'm Dr. Bossi. And I'm Negin Keshavarzian. Well, we have a special guest. Uh, Negin, what qualifies you to talk about the laws in Iran? Um, so I was a law student at the University of Tehran and I graduated and I then entered master's degree, same in the University of Tehran, and then I came to the U.S. to get my master's degree again, and I graduated in December 2023. So wow. how many years did you study law in Iran? Um, I think five years. Okay, and then how many years here? Uh, two. Two? Yeah. So seven years, that's a good time. That's so a lot of time. That's a lot of time. How much of that knowledge from Iran were you able to transfer over to the U.S.? So um, it's tricky because everyone basically says that if you study law in Iran, then it's no good. You have to go start everything over. But the thing is, um, the principles that you learn, like the basics, they're all the same. So you you just learn the same things, but apply different rules. So, and I mean, our legal system is um, different because Iran is civil law and uh, America uses uh, common law, which means that their primary source of law is cases. Uh, versus Iran, in which the primary source of law is laws and regulations, which is basically written law. So that is so different. And you have to learn like how to do your research. Because mm -hmm. in Iran, when you want to look for something, for example, is this thing a crime? You go and look at the criminal code. It's all written there. But in the U.S., you have to go through maybe hundreds of cases and you have to search. More complex here then. Yeah, very complex. And all this stuff comes at two levels, state and federal. So it mm -hmm. makes it even more complicated. No, but let's, you know, we always talk about law, law, law. What is law? What is it? Uh, you learned it in the school. Yeah. Us. <laughs> so it's. Most of the time, the first session of every class we had was like, okay, guys, what is law? Um, so law is, it's not a science. So because you can say this is true, this is false. There is no fact. It's all human made. But um, it's an area of knowledge to regulate human relationships. Like, for example, when you are, you have a maybe romantic relationship, it's called marriage and there's come some legal consequences. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I am selling you as a thing. We have a contract. Then there is a uh, regul. Uh, there is a contract, and it needs to be regulated. So here's some law again. Yeah, is it fair to say that uh, what society agrees a norm that we have to abide on is can be called law? Yeah, right. It's it's basically um, one of the bases that could be there for like having a law or regulation there are different backgrounds for example a country might um, place all its laws like on the basis of their religion or maybe, like in iran like in iran yeah mostly or in dictatorships um maybe the president or whatever they just decrease the law just, yeah they yeah. just go forward with their own intention but yeah. um the strongest basis is what people want because the law is for them so um, it's good to like base it on what the people want and what they believe. And you know, and as a matter of fact, you know, it that yes, if we talked about what law is, but we talked about now we are talking about where the origin of the law is, which yeah. can be a dictator, right? There or can be a religious background, or can be a democratic process, and so on. And not necessarily just because the sources are different, it by itself make it superior or not. Like one of the oldest laws in our country in yeah. Iran is the Cyrus Cylinder. That's you want to talk about it? But Cyrus, yeah. that was decreed by a dictator by by all regards, correct? Yeah, that's Okay, true. go ahead. Tell and, me, what um, is it? You know, it's, it's like living proof that law existed since, I don't know, how many years ago? Because 2,500 years ago. Yeah, so that's a lot. And um, it shows that people like naturally come to a conclusion that there needs to be something to regulate. And um, of course, like I think Cyrus alone wrote that it was not democracy um, by today's definition, but it was one of the like um, best empires like 
back then. And so, what is mm -hmm. what is this Cyrus cylinder? The Cyrus cylinder is actually a clay cylinder. That what he said was uh, engraved in that. At the you now, what the uh, the original Persian was one of the first languages to use alphabet, not hieroglyph, not pictorial. It, no, it wasn't the pictorial, but they said, but the actual alphabet they used, they used different kind of like, um, like engraving in a clay. And because uh, the, 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 in the, it's called cuneiformi, uh, cuneiform language because you just make an impression, straight impression in the clay, and depending on how many in what direction, that's a different letter. And that was for their time. Now you get a piece of clay that's still soft. You make the impression, and when when it dries, it's there yeah. forever. That's what they say, written in stone. Written exactly. in stone, come more or less from that. Okay, and if you want, you can as well. Put it to a high temperature, then it is truly forever. So you're not it necessarily up... referring to the laws written on the stone. You're talking about the stone itself. No, the cuneiform, the Cyrus cylinder is actual a cylinder made of clay, where those what yeah, Cyrus no, said, that. what Cyrus said is written there, and he declares the first version of a human right. And it's still somewhere like in, a, in France, maybe. What it, it is still more advanced than, you know, like for the first time, 2,500 years ago, while well, we abolished slavery in the United States, what, 150 years ago? About 150, 160 yeah. years well, ago. I mean, I think that's when we started, but it wasn't just like slavery's done. It's yeah, yeah. like, don't do slavery. Yeah, yeah. And then people kept doing like no rules. Yeah. But in Cyrus Cylinder, literally says, you cannot have somebody work for you without pay. Practically abolishing slavery. Yeah, it is a big deal because back then people just used to fight for everything. And so you would just kill someone to get his property or get his wife and why. children, a slave and so on. And everybody knows that it's even in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Hi, Anna. Uh, <laughs> that Cyrus went and freed all the Jews from Babylonian slavery. He didn't just uh, free the Jews. He freed all the slaves because slavery was forbidden in the Persian Empire 2,500 years ago, literally <laughs> 2,340 years before America <laughs> abolished the slavery. Are, so are those laws that are written on his stone? No, it's a cylinder. It's actually cylinder. Yeah. And then the addition... But are they still in, like... Effect? Yeah. Yeah, to be in, in the core Iran... In the core Iran, we have never had slavery, ever. It came when the Mongols captured Iran. They brought the slavery, but as soon as they got, went away, slavery went away. When Arab captured Iran, it was slavery, but as soon as the Iran, you know, the Arabs were gone. In honestly, the... it's a sign of civilization. We always had laws, written things, but yeah. all these uh, groups that uh, captured Iran in like a period in history, Mongols and Arabs, um, they were, in that time, they were famous for not having this kind of laws and regulations. They used to fight. And we, like Persians, um, they had laws, they had like culture, the art, architecture, everything. Yeah. So I think there is a connection. Like law is somehow related to being civilized. And, yeah, and law is very structured. And I think yeah. it sets a tone for how your communities should be acting. There are a few good stories out there that I want to really mention. Number one, is that everybody knows uh, that everybody knows all these stories about Greece, uh, Greece and Ro Rome and Roman and Greeks and so on and so forth, because it was war, war, war. This city, Athena, fought uh, the Ithaca. Ithaca captured this and so on, and Spartan killed everybody and so on. You don't hear much about Iran in that time frame. Because it was peaceful. It was not much to say. People just lived their lives. It wasn't, there were few wars, especially between Iran, or Persia, and the Greeks and the Romans. And they have done uh, f uh, 40 movies about every single time that the Roman or the Greeks won. But in reality, the Greeks and the Romans won less than 20% of the wars. 80% of the time, Iran, Persia 
Wonder Wars, but for every like that 300, the movie 300, that really upset a lot of Iranian because they're, the, the, the Spartan, they were wild beasts. They were uncivilized. They would go and their rite of passage was go and kill like a peasant. A, like a gang initiation. Yeah, that was the rite of passage. And Athena, the democracy, democracy, democracy. It was oligarchy, oligarchy that certain families who had money decide what happens and so on. And, and, and it was war, war, war. As a matter of fact, the 300, the, 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 the Battle of Thermopylae happened because the Spartan went and massacred in today's Turkey other Greek in their temple. And by law, by Iranian law, the Iranian army has to come and react and defend the Greek. That part of the Turkey was Greek before. Right. The Iranian army, by law, has to come and defend those Why? Greeks. Their, their, their territory. They, those Greeks were living under umbrella of Persian Empire, and because this uh, savage Spartan, everybody knows Spartan were yeah. savage. They would take a child from their mother, and if the child has any deficiency, they would throw it off the cliff. Okay? And they would torture them until they were beasts, and then they would send them to kill people. So that was the time that, you know, the slavery was everywhere. And in Iranian or Persian empire, it was laws that would prevent, like one of the laws was that you can worship whatever God you want to worship. And as a matter of fact, Iranian, the Persian were a Zaratastrian, but those Greek, they were not. And still, per Iran, Persian law, they have to come and protect them against the Spartan. By the way, the Spartan lost. But still, <laughs> you, you know, all the movies, so you see that this evil Persian Empire, it is this uh, north and south uh, kind of uh, policy in the, in the Western country that everything is in north is good, everything in south is in bad. But let's talk about Iranian law. So the concept of the law is not new, not in Iran. In the, most of the other countries, including in Western countries, many of our laws are impregnated with our religion, culture, or heritage, and so is no different in Iran. So the laws that you study, Negin, in Iran, they tell us, you know, you, you said first thing you do, you learn about what is law. Second thing you do, you learn what is the origin of the law, that in Iran, even though it's, it's lots of the religious background to that, but I'm sure there are some other background to the laws in Iran. Tell me. Yeah, right. Uh, so it's mostly, uh, besides Sharia, it's mostly taken from um, European law and mostly France. So because we have pretty much the same like legal system, so um, some some rules, they are like word by word the same, like yeah. exactly similar to uh, France laws. Yeah. So that's another. Like what would basis. be an example? Um, so, I mean, this is not a nice example, and France later removed like that law completely. But we still have it. We still have it. But and I personally don't like it because my concentration was criminal law, and so this is what I had to um, know about and everything. And I was always so embarrassed. I was like, this is not something you want in your code. And I, it, I was super surprised knowing that it has come from France. But then I, I realized that France removed it. So it basically says that um, if a husband walks in a room and um, basically sees um, his wife cheating on him, the man could kill them both and not be punished. Wow. And I mean, I understand like in the United basis. States there is a crime of I compassion. Mean, Sometimes I in some states yeah, it's called they get away with it. And it's um, crime yeah, of passion, yeah. But it's very narrow. For example, if somebody assaults you and I don't know tells you all kind of bad, of bad offensive words, you you don't have the right to kill them under heat of passion. It's very narrow. And you still are going to be punished. It's just in a lower degree. Like it's not in America. Iran. No, in America. And in America. I, yeah, I yeah. get that. It's like it's logical. It's reasonable. Yeah. But in Iran, it's just you just walk away from it. <laughs> you just say it, throw something like that in your code of law, and that's it. So no punishment. I mean, no. We know. We all know how 
uh, had uh, you know how uh, the, the heated the French people are, right? That, yeah. that just now yeah. it's interesting you say that because the French law used to be like thousand laws. Each village has its own law. People who study France and French law, as a matter of fact, that was the origin of most of the laws in Europe. Right. It's called something called the Na Napoleonic Code. Did you guys learn about that in the law um, school? We did not have that. I have heard. Yeah. The, practically, Europe, each, each area had its own law. And something that was a crime in one wasn't a crime in the other one. One of the things that Napoleon did, he codified entire France with single rule. By unifying them, it made it easier and it uh, and take it away from the direct supervision of the church. Because in every church, in every village, it was a church and the, the priest in the church would decide if you live or die. And he unified that and took it away from the church and made it a part of the government. And then other countries in, U in Europe followed. And then we took it over. So even the United States, many of our codes, like what you just described, right. is still Napoleonic code. Yes. Okay. And yes. those things were, even though may, may be harsh for now, but at that time, it's okay. We are talking about the time that they would take a woman who doesn't listen to his husband, they convict her as a witch, and then they wrap her and throw it in the in the river. If she floats, she's a witch, and they burn her. But if she sinks and dies, she's not a witch, but then, eh, she, goes then she goes to heaven, you know? Then we are talking about that, and then all of a sudden, okay. That was in the U.S. that that was happening. Actually. But that comes from, obviously, from yeah. Europe. European are not as civilized. Everybody there are not as civilized as they pretend to be. Yeah, but the thing is, the law should be dynamic and it has to change like through time. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, um, this law or things like that, they might have been reasonable for uh, their time. And I understand that, but they should change somehow. Yeah. But in Iran specifically, the process of changing the law has become super hard and nearly impossible that i think it's not healthy because <laughs> you can basically change anything yeah. so what does the process look like so um in our constitution it says that um people has to so nicely has to ask their like something equal to their senators people who are in legislation um for example i'm from the city tehran so mm -hmm. i call Representative. Um, the representative for Tehran who sits in legislation and ask them to, could you please in your next meeting um, throw this and let's see what happened. I, I don't like this. No, it's basically that. You have to you have to go through legislation. So and it is not possible. So yeah. it's it's never gonna go so, through. So but I think what, that's the work of the legislation yeah, to change the laws, right? What's the, and then what what else the do they do? In the US? So in the US, um one of the good things, so it matters. For example, in Europe, the countries are mostly very small sized comparing to the US. Um, US is so big, so different cultures. So every state has its own laws and regulations. Of course, there are some federal laws, but each state has its own. And also um, the, the, the officials for each state, they are responsible for that. I mean, um, one of the most um, controversial stuff was that recently um, there was a Supreme Court. Um, Supreme Court told that you, women cannot abort, mm -hmm. like it prohibited abortion. I mean, um, I personally, I'm against that. I think people have need to like have the right to do that because it's their own body, their own life. But at the same time, I think that perhaps in that region, that court and uh, the judges, the officials, they saw something. Maybe that's the thing that the people of that region think and believe in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I might disagree, but maybe it's good for those people. Maybe it's in Iran. Like Let's it. talk about actual laws in Iran. Something that, you know, I think lots of people have this misconception and let's talk about, you know, the laws of an Iran, we call it is from Sharia or meaning Islamic law. And as soon as you hear the word Sharia, 
Some people say, dun, 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 oh my dun, gosh, it's just, you know, that's barbaric, not this and so on. Let's talk about some of those because some of those laws, I like them actually pretty good. Not like, like what? Like, you know, in the, the, um, the one of the laws, you correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. When somebody commits a murder and the states goes through the process and they convict them of a murder and the crime of the murder is punished by death, which is not different in many U.S. states. It's the same. There's a death, you know, capital punishment for that. But I have heard that the states try to, uh, to convince the family to forgive. The family of the deaf person can forgive the, in the U.S. or in, in, in Iran? That makes sense to me. No, but and it even goes further. It goes even further. The the family can forgive him and ask for some money or you know, compensation, or they can commute it to life sentence. I have heard. Or if in some cases the state says, "Okay, you absolutely want to take a life for a life." Okay, you do that. They bring the prisoner. They put it on a on a um, on a noose. But the the person who says I want him dead has to go and push the chair and kill him. You say, okay, you want to do that? You really want to take a life and you don't want to forgive? It's your right. But you go ahead and do it. And I have heard that many people in that position they cannot bring it over themselves. If they are all of a sudden, they have to go. They bring the prisoner. They blindfold it. They put it on a on a on a large noose and so on. But if you really want, the state says we we did our work. If you want him dead, you go and push it. And I have heard many people who then at that point forgive the murderer, and so on. He deserved to die. But you see, the compassion comes to yeah. play, and that and I think that is unbelievably fantastic thing. It is, should be the right of the people who lost their loved one yeah. to decide if that person should die or not. Yeah, I've heard of stories where someone lost their loved one and they really actually didn't want the other person who committed the crime to get capital punishment or life because that person was young when mm -hmm. they committed the crime and maybe it wasn't a complete, like, they didn't, it wasn't in cold blood. Yeah. So I can see that. Yeah. Giving someone else a second chance. To yeah, well, see, you see that there? That is it. I think that is it brings the law to compassion. They go through the process. The legal steps are this you know, a revision or appeal or whatever. But in, in, and in some cases, you know, we don't need to sugarcoat it. It is some laws are barbaric, you know, like lashing and so on. But I hear that they're not being done that often anymore. Or what, how is the situation in Iran with Sharia law with the corporal punishment? So um, they're obviously there, like in the books. But um, they try so hard not to execute them, actually. And um, I mean, yes, in my opinion, many of those laws are barbaric, but um, they are making the procedure for, um, you know, rules of evidence and stuff like this harder to prove. So, for example, um, having a sexual relationship, uh, like a marriage, wedlock, uh, is a crime. And it's punishable. It's a very serious crime in Islam. And it's, um, I think people would get lashed a hundred times. And um, it's cruel. But at the same time, they are trying not to execute that. And um, they are making it so hard to prove. And they're like, okay, four people has to testify. That they saw it. That they, 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 yeah. they have to be, okay. Yes, they have to have, like, look at it straight. Yeah. So, and it's, it's not a possibility because people usually don't do that like that. Well, they don't do it in the, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. No, no. So what if you're like, what if you're like, oh yeah, she's my, my friend. She, you're not really friends. And she told me. No, no, no it has, it to, has be a, to be a visual. It has to be a direct vision. Yeah. It's has interesting because in the U.S. don't they discount um, visual? Like if, like if you saw something with your own eyes, you can't really use that as evidence anymore. In the no, you can. You uh, can. I know that in in US, you have to um, absorb everything with your senses. And um, if you saw something and you told me, now I have to testify. So that's you, hearsay. That's hearsay. Yeah, so, but I thought I, I thought in the US, like eyewitness testimony is a lot less credited these days. 
Right. Yes, correct. But it's still, it's still the yeah. big thing. Now in Iran, um, the law says if you are un, unmarried and you have a, a sexual relationship, you get hundred lashes. And but to get there, you have to, four people have to come and say we saw it with our own eyes. So it becomes really really hard to prove that. Even it's not enough to, um, for them to walk out of an apartment or something or not being in an apartment. Yeah, or even, I don't know, cuddling or hugging each other, not enough. Like Yeah, you have to see yeah. that. So it's so practically like, no, let me tell you something. There are laws in some of the state in the United States that they are, they, they are not being obviously... No, there's laws like that. You can't walk your horse on a Sunday or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, We yeah. actually have these outrageous laws, but then we also so, have laws about like yeah. sleeping in the same bed as someone. We yeah. do have those but laws here. We don't obviously we don't, enforce don't them. them. And I think Iran is on the way of putting the burden of proof so high that nobody really bothers to go and really mm -hmm. try to enforce them. And I think that's a, that is a good way. See, um, to go to the core of the law and say this is a bad law, you have to go all the way, fight back. Where did the law come from? From Islam, from Sharia. That is a burden that's too high. That's a mountain too high to climb. But by adjusting the, the burden of proof, we are bringing this law in 21st century. That is, I think, what's happening in Iran. Yeah. Another thing that I really like to know is the laws in the marriage in Iran. Because everybody thinks, oh, there is um, um, the poor woman, they just get married at nine, uh, when they're nine years old and so on. Reality is much different, right? Why don't you tell us a little about the marriage laws in Iran? Yes, yeah, so um, it was one of the things that uh, Iran's law uh, was always struggling with Islam, because in Islam, um, there is not really such as something such as an age limit for marriage. But um, Iran tried so hard to protect obviously children so right now i think um that age is 18 so um people under this age cannot get married but unless um the court gives some special certification about their maturity and this stuff so they they could not like abolish that completely but they made it harder so you need to go through some um so, sort so of different you need to procedure. go to a court procedure now, in there was something you need to know in a United States, a forty-year-old girl can get married, married un, uh, until uh, um, you know okay, if you I get parent so. consent. So um, that is. I think they have to be like in the same age range at least. No, they don't it's have to like, be. No, no. And if the parent consent, mm -hmm. a forty-year-old can get married and so on. But what I hear in Iran, they have to go through a court. Right. For that to happen. I think that is... I thought in the U.S. you still had to go through something. No. I think in some states, from state, different so to state. you print out the paper from Google and then... No, the parent of the minor has to consent yeah. to the but they marriage. Have, what's the, do you know what the consent process looks like? No, they just say, yes, we are agreeing with that. Or if the minor has emancipated herself, then she mm -hmm. can consent yeah. herself. That's true. Okay? So it is. it seems from what I hear, it's easier for underage person to marry in the United States than in Iran. Yeah, but still, you know, um, some the courts might be corrupted in yeah. many different regions of Iran. So you still, there is no official statistics about this stuff, but you still hear so many children getting married and you're like, okay, how did this happen? Yeah. So there is... How, how is the marriage process itself? Because there is a legal path to get there, right, in Iran. Um, right, for underage people? No, generally, for generally. I want to know the, the rights of the woman in a marriage in Iran. Oh, so first of all, um, a woman needs her father's permission to get married. And if the father is not alive, then the grandfather and so on. So, um, and unless uh, this is not their first marriage. So women only need it for their first marriage. And um, so they go and um, there's something called... Mm, and it's like an amount of it could be money. It's a diary. It's a it's a dowry. 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 Yeah. It's um. 
it's like nowadays people don't usually exchange this kind of stuff because it was for the time that um the man used to work and the woman used to stay at home doing their you know houseworks but nowadays both husband and wife they both work so people don't usually so do back this. in the day like the dowry went to the parents or the wife uh, go to the wife, wife, like, the wife. yeah the wife. And she saved it so, for in case maybe. yeah so in the most of the western countries all the uh, it's a communal possession everything the house everything you own belongs to men and women no, we don't have that in iran there is a separation of property from the start ever i mean the husband never get things from the woman and vice versa except what they promised to each other and Men promise a certain amount of money to a woman, and I heard that lately that was like a like astronomic <laughs> number, right? That yeah, that was. Yeah, some people would say that. I don't know. Like I'm a million gold bars. So I need two thousand like coins. Gold coins, <laughs> which is a lot. And it yeah, it's like you know, like. 20 million dollar or something you know yeah and it was a thing like the yeah. year you were born it was a thing yeah, and yeah. now people uh, specifically the, the husband's family they are not really willing to do that because yeah. they have seen so many marriages broken and then the husband is left with a lot of debt a no. mountain of debt oh, people wow. usually do use you know it was originally it was a real uh, realistic amount that would help the woman to recover their life after divorce, if the divorce would happen. And woman, you, woman can't ask for that money anytime, but they usually would ask for it after divorce. Now, obviously, they, in their, they, it was romanticized, and then, oh, you're worth so much to me, I'm going to give you right. 20 million gold coin or something. And some divorces that went nasty, the woman says, I want that 20 million gold. He promised it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it's law. It's law the law. And people start scratching their head. Are you guys crazy? I mean, that is, and, but it is the law. Is the law. So those, some women, some men, they can go to prison for that if they, they cannot pay that. Yeah, now they have um, also like not they changed the burden. It. So you can uh, maybe go to jail for up to, I guess, 100 coins, gold coins. And for more than that, you can be arrested. So it's just... So, but, what, but it was a big deal because yeah. many of these women would now all of a sudden understand the law. Say, you know, you piece of garbage, you... <laughs> That you didn't treat me right, or for whatever reason, I hate your guts. I'm going to go to court and get. I know you don't have that much money, but I'm going to. Your our divorce will end up in your prison. <laughs> so, now, but I heard that, and uh, now they have brought laws that those extraordinary things are not that unrealistic amounts are not allowed anymore. Is that true? Um, it is allowed, but I think that. People Modern don't agree on that. Is that the husband and his family? They are not going to agree to that, because um, like <laughs> by, by default, women um, don't have some rights in a yeah. marriage. Like only a man can divorce his wife, not vice versa. Uh, and um, so, and and many things like that. Like a woman, a woman cannot um, go to a university or school or whatever without um, permission. Her husband's permission. We have many things like that, but. People usually, when they want to enter the marriage, they write it down, they correct it. They're like, okay, no, we can both do the divorce. We can, I can go to the university. So, but right at the beginning of the marriage, you can overcome the status yeah. quo by making your own rule that, okay, the law says you can marry me, uh, you can divorce me, but we can divorce each other. Here, sign here. The law says I need your permission to go to university or even travel out of the country. Here, you sign that you waive that right or I have the permission to do all of that and so on. So it is like a, like a prenup, even yeah. though material stuff are separated, they overcome the shortcoming of the law by, the mutual, by a mutual agreement. And, you know, the man is in love and so on. He's going to sign almost everything and so on. And I have heard that sometimes it actually now backfires because there are some rules that limit the man more than the woman, not rules, but some agreements and so on. And man agrees to all of that. He, he just want to get married. And then, um, so let's, uh, now they are married. Um, in, as you know, in the United States, 90% or more, 95% of the time, women 
practically assumes husband credentials like yeah, that come from England when um, when Mary married Mr. Uh, Harry Smith she uh, she f- she was done being her own personality she became the property or mistress of Mr. Harry Smith so if they would go to some place they would be announced that Mrs. and Mr. Harry Smith meaning here they come Mr. Harry Smith and his mistress or property and so on so but that's not how names are in Iran right how are names no it's also abolished in the United States but in Iran um that the, the woman keeps like his last name his identity and everything so it was I don't remember a time or I haven't heard that the, a woman had to like adapt his husband's last name or anything but in you I said that's still a status it's quo standard. That's standard in the United States. It's standard, yeah, but people are starting to go a little bit away from that. Actually, a lot of people now are making their own last names when they get married. They make up names? Yeah, I know someone, (laughs) actually, I know someone I'm really close with, and when him and his partner get married, they're just coming up with a whole new one. (laughs) Well, you know, you grew up with an identity, and most of people in Iran, they keep their identity. Yeah. Mm Now, rights regarding the divorce. You said some of that, that, you know, that, um, it officially the man can divorce no but but i need to say during the marriage process the woman marry herself to the husband yeah. says i will marry myself to you for this condition for this dowry and then the man says i accept so practically the process of marriage is is in her hand in her hand but the process of divorce is in his hand. Yeah, true. And Meaning he has to initiate it? No, he has to say, I divorce you. And then, no, I mean, it's more than that. It's a legal process. Yeah, but um, it's false-based. So if the husband has the right to divorce, um, a woman cannot ask the court for a divorce for, I don't know, reasons like, I don't love him anymore, or he doesn't treat me well. It has to be something serious. Like, he is super addicted to, like, some drugs. And it is making our life miserable. And you have to show proof for that. So it's wise to, like, from the beginning, just um, do the paperwork so both our Mm -hmm. parties have the right to divorce. Yeah. And then, but, you know, then there is a rule that I thought always is so interesting. So, you know, you can divorce somebody and marry that person again, right? (laughs) So what I want to talk about, go, you take take on the thing. So... If you do it, do this process, like marrying someone, divorce them, go back to them again. Persians are so emotional. I Divorce, marry again, divorce, marry again. Okay. So um, if you do it, I guess nine times. Three times. Oh, I think uh, it's three times. If you do three times, you have to somehow fix it. They are like, if you do that three times, you can obviously make up your mind. So you can get married again. Until... Until the woman marries another man, yeah, so and consummate the marriage, torture the husband, and you have to watch your woman go to another man at least one time. Then, then okay, go on, you can marry. That, that and does it makes sense to me. Actually. That, that, that's what <laughs> I'm saying. Makes a lot of sense that to makes me. sense. Yeah, because it's like maybe there's something better out there. Just try. Yeah, and no, then, no. And if this process yeah. just repeats itself nine times. The man is done. Like you can never be married to each other ever. Stop Again, that madness. Okay. So <laughs> oh, wow. it's called the, the it's called the, the triple divorce thing rule. So the man, you know, just they fight and so on. I divorce you and done. Okay. <laughs> so oh, I'm sorry. Let's get together. They get together. If he divorces her three times, by a law, they cannot get married until the woman, not the man, marries another man and consummate that marriage so okay yeah you know that's what you get from <laughs> yeah, people divorce i think it makes a lot of sense yeah, i know I she know. might be in she might be in like a manipulative situation where he's like he's divorcing her this and that and it she is to punish the man though is she no maybe it's as a... let me please talk <laughs> and then she's in a, in a manipulative situation so she can't get away so she keeps only going back to him. So now she has to have the ability to go to another man and maybe stay with him if she likes okay. him. Let me tell you funny part of it. 
there is a group of men that is how they live <laughs> that's their only job they marry this triple divorced woman do they get paid Yes, they get paid. That makes sense. No, the men get paid. Yeah. It's that not that makes woman... makes sense for them. They're doing a favor so she can get married again to the love of her life. If, if that the same person. Yeah, she that doesn't... is so toxic. I mean, <laughs> what's love? <laughs> yeah. Literally, yeah. Yeah. So, but can you imagine there is a group of men, they sit in the place where people go for marriage. They're just waiting there. <laughs> if somebody wants, okay, you want to come here and... Do... I very much can imagine it, actually. I can <laughs> so, visualize it. There is, there is another thing that is very controversial. Sire. Right. Tell about that. What is Sire? Um, so... I mean, it's just by Shiites, right? But not I, by Sunnis. I think so, yeah. No, I, I don't guess. I, I'm positive. Yes, mm -hmm. it's true. Um, I told you that um, you can have um, sexual relationship out of wedlock. So um, people and usually men who are somehow religious or they care about how they would appear in front of others, they, they want to have this kind of relationship, but they don't want a real marriage. So there is this way. It's kind of a short-term marriage. <laughs> and it's how short can it be? So you can... Uh, marry for 15 minutes. It. So anything you want. Uh, 15 minutes. People, Until 15 minutes, you're fine. Yeah. After that, it's illegal. I've heard 10 days. I've heard one month. I've heard 99 days. I don't know why 99 days. So, and people do that. And um, uh, the man in this scenario has to give that dowry Right yeah. away. Um, yeah. So it's compulsory in this situation. So somehow uh, they might just like give a piece of chocolate to a woman and be married to them for, I don't know, one week and then it's done. So yeah, it's funny. How, how, okay. how official is it? Do you have to go to a place or do you can just initiate it between two persons? No, I mean, these kind of things, they, they're not official most of the times because, because it's important to people. Um, they, they don't like to be judged or anything. So they usually do it between themselves. Okay, it's, so, it's but like a transcript you have to read. Do you have to have like two men watching? Like two men? Witness, watching? witness. Yeah. No, you don't. For, for okay. Sida, you don't. So you, so you can practically go anywhere. You know? No, we were having a temporary marriage. You just, what, what? Yeah, honestly, yes. So um, there was a period of time if you are a girl and you're out with your boyfriend mm -hmm. uh, in public, the police would uh, stop you and uh, would call. Uh, would ask you, okay, what are your relationship? Who is this girl? Who is this guy? Are you married? Do I want? Uh, do I want to call your parents and ask? And this kind of stuff. Um, honestly, one of our law professors told us, and if anything like that should happen, just tell them that we're married. And if it gets serious, you can just say that uh, it was a sida or something like that yeah which because, is by law yeah yeah and it is legal and it is islamic completely so yeah. all right so so the process is so interesting there is a like a like a like a, a magical sentence that you have to say <laughs> and then I've, once you say that magical sentence and then you say for how long and for how much money okay so it is like uh, I'm making my who who reads it, woman or man? I think the man reads it, but the woman should state that she agrees. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he says, "I make you my wife for one week, for three hundred dollar." Okay, <laughs> then they're married. And so that's that's some people call it legal or uh, state-sponsored prostitution. Yeah, honestly, that's my problem. You. You put something out there like this is the law, and then you have to come up with ways around it. So, why why do you do that? <laughs> and then the ways around it are the law too. Yeah. So so and that that has been criticized, but on the other side, I think what I admire about that, if you go that path, if the child is born, right, then yeah. the child has rights. It's not vacuum. It's not it. You know, the, um, Think about that, that it is only in the last hundred years that we have access to contraceptives. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't like this all the time. And the, and the man cannot walk away from the. They are so serious about child children rights and this stuff. They don't want children to be born out of wedlock. So they, they push the man to accept the responsibilities of, of a father. Yeah. And so that's, you know, see, it is silly in a way when you consider, you know, 
if a woman doesn't want to, she's not, she's not going to get pregnant from this temporary marriage. Yeah, it seems like almost a way to protect the woman too and, and the child, but also the woman because at the end of the day, if a woman gets pregnant out of wedlock, it's her responsibility. In the United in States, US, yeah, but not in Iran. Yeah. So that is actually, I think... Even it, in the United States, if it's out of wedlock, a man can say, like, I don't want anything to do with this child, and he doesn't have, he can give up his rights, and he doesn't have to support the child at all. Um, yeah, you, but the woman can sue the man for but child you, support. But and if so you on. give up your rights, then my understanding is if you give up your rights to your child, you don't pay child support mm, because it's not your child. Well, then. we can check on that. We have a lawyer here, but I, that's not my understanding. It's one of the areas which is um, very different in different states, but... Um, I think that's true. If a man like gives up everything, like if one day the child is going to be adopted by some family, mm -hmm. you cannot object. You have no right to um, make, build any kind of relationship with the child. Mm -hmm. No visiting, no nothing. So in this way, the man can go, uh, just get away with that. Yeah, well, um, I thought that even if you give up your right to visitation and so on, you can be still liable for child support in the United States. But you have a lawyer. You should check it out and report to us in the okay. next podcast. Now, what uh, what else do you want to know about the laws well, in Iran? In the, in the U.S., like the laws in Iran, we hear about them being very controversial when it comes to women, um, women's rights, especially regarding like modesty and things like that. We talked about it three years ago with Melika. Yeah, we did about the you now rules of you know covering yourself and you know, the the practically what happened to Masa Amini. Um, but 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 that was as well three years ago. Yeah, something that was like three that. years yeah. ago, and here it's it's toned down a lot, like being spoken about here. But so, yes. how are the rules regarding you know women in the public in Iran? So it's just another law which is there, but no one observes it. So, um, according to law, women have to have um, hijabs according to Sharia, which means that only like the face can show and two hands from there and up there so that's it but um if you like walk down in the streets of iran you don't see that people do not wear that um do not um wear head scarves or things like that um their hands might be showing i don't know different kind of stuff so no one observes that and um and last year it was um a girl was stopped by a, a special kind of police, mm -hmm. um, morality police, morality police, and because she she did not wear his uh, wear her hijab correctly, and um, there was some kind of struggling and stuff, and finally she died. And it another started, woman beside Massa. I mean? No, I'm talking about Massa. Yeah, and yeah. it started like a huge um, thing in Iran. People will people were in streets. Um, we heard all about that. Yeah, yeah. Objecting. And on the other side, um, the regime was trying so hard to suppress everybody. So, yeah, it, it was terrible and very scary. But um, I don't know. The only th beautiful thing about it was that I think after that, um, women like gained the courage to um, dress at least as they want. Not completely, but at least do not wear the head of scarf. And th there's still some uh, some um, things from the uh, regime side. For example, they threaten you that if you don't wear your uh, head scarf, you are not allowed to use the subway. And people just have to go through them, fight them. Yeah. And just, yeah. So it's still super hard, but at least I think women have the courage to do that. So, you know, I think uh, we have seen that in lots of Persian people. You know, do you remember the joke I was telling you about? How the forbidden. the forbidden, yeah. yeah. Tell the joke. Tell okay. So um, the negin, um, there are four people on the Eiffel Tower, and the devil goes to God and says, yeah. you know, have you heard that? No. It says, do you, I can I I bet I can make them all jump from the Eiffel Tower. God says, I gave them brain. Really? Okay, try. <laughs> um, devil goes to the first person who's a German guy. What do you think he tells to the German guy? To make him jump. Jump is an order. <laughs> yes, sir. Jumps. Goes to the, the French guy. Uh, what do you think he says to the French guy? To make him jump. Or Italian. Almost the same. I don't know. 
Jump is fashion. <laughs> oh, right. Makes sense. <laughs> Goes to the British guy and say, what do you think he says to British guy to make him jump? Oh. <laughs> Again, yeah. Jump. Tradition. But you must know by now what devil tells to the Persian guy to make him jump. Jump is forbidden. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think this is what I like about us. You know, yeah, they are all... Rebels. Putting, yeah, to you are born stuff. as rebels. Like, I think we are the only nation. We had two revolutions in less than, I think, in 72, three years. We had two revolutions. And this is so close. You can do that. But, but we yeah, just, maybe just do. Yeah, we just keep doing it, yeah. We just mess ourselves up again and again and again. Now, um, obviously, the laws at the end of the day um, is not what on the book, but what um, is literally in what practice, practice what yeah. practice makes the law move it in one way one direction or another and i think considering that the people are, of iran are extremely educated extremely up to date and uh, what's going on around the world i think and considering that uh, doing forbidden things and bending the rules is the one of the characteristic of the iranian i think they have done a they have done a good job to make a living in a situation that's not really the best. Okay, I think they have done a great job. But what I admire about that as well, people there that they make the best out of so un uh, so suboptimal situation. They have done the best out of it. Like I have heard that sixty percent of the university students are women in Iran. Right. I've heard that the most of the doctors they go to school are women. Women are what? What can per law a woman do or not do in Iranian society? Um, Is there anything that the woman cannot be, but obviously cannot be a supreme leader? Right. Okay. Yeah, no, she like by law she could be everything. Like there are some glass ceilings. Like it's super hard for a woman to be a president. Perhaps she wouldn't get so much support, but that's just because of like. But the same in culture. U.S. But, yeah, yeah, same with here. Yeah. But by I, law, it's okay. Actually, I have a question. I think it's interesting how Iran has it does the best sex change operations, right? Here you are. So, That's another interesting area. Yeah. Do people do trans? Is it because there's a lot of transgender people there? Or are people going there for the surgery because they have good doctors? Honestly, I'm not very optimistic about this situation because, um, per Iran's law, it is a crime to be homosexual. Um, so people in Iran, the doctors and everything, they prefer, for example, I'm a girl and I'm attracted to girls. They prefer for me to be a boy and be attracted to girls. So I think that's because they don't want me to be punished yeah. or be a criminal. So I think that's the reason I'm saying I'm not optimistic, but, um, so yes, that's the I, reason. I, yeah, like in my opinion, there's nothing official, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I can be optimistic, but, um, yeah, that's true. Like um, this kind of surgeries and transitions, they happen so They're really good. Iranian really doctors, good. yeah. I, uh, a friend of mine um, went uh, through the same thing. Um, and woman to man or man to woman? Um, woman to man. And um, like the university, it was important for them when you want to enter the University of Tehran, you had to have like your hijab somehow. So it was important to them. But as soon as my friend started this process, um, he had this paper saying that I'm going through this process so no one would make uh, make him go through hijab or things that mm. is specific to women. So they so support I think, that part. Yeah, that's, that's something. That's very progressive that right when you start transitioning, you have the same rights yeah. as a man. We're here in the U.S. Like when you're oh, they're still fighting it. So they're tough. still fighting it. It's really yeah. tough for trans people here. Yeah. They don't even know what bathrooms they can go into and things like that. So well, but it seems that in Iran, as soon as you start the transition, even your bodily still a woman, you are considered a man in the eyes of the law. And yeah. in society, most people, when they see this paper, they accept it for what it says. Yeah, they accept it. I mean, still, it's a cultural struggle. Perhaps, but no, you have every every legal right. For example, men are usually sent to a mandatory period of military service. Um, and if you were born like um, a man and then you transition to a woman, as soon as you start the process, 
you, you, you are not going to do that. You what about the other way around? If you're a woman and you trans- transition to a man, do you have to do the military? I think for military specifically, no, because... Um, so women are advantageous. Uh, to, to, I'm to not that. sure, but I think um, one factor there is like the bodily strength and everything. So I think not. But um, but women also, I mean, women who are transitioning to men, they also have everything, the paperwork, as mm-hmm. soon as they start transitioning. Now, there is a lot, little bit of a chauvinistic kind of aspect to that. The punishment for uh, male homosexual is much higher than for female homosexual in, in, in Iran. It is like the same thing that all those homophobes, they still like to see two women with each other. Well, and isn't it also like if you're the receiving male in the sex? I, I, I'm sure there are some differences there and so on, yeah. but I'm not sure. So, yeah, um, the punishment for um, gay men are so harsh comparing to uh, women who are lesbians and their receiving men um, is more punished more. death penalty, so that is super harsh. Um, but the other uh, just, I think, 100 not a hundred, maybe seventy, eighty lashes. Is it know, still so. practiced though? I mean, it's it's like um, heterosexual people. You have to have like witnesses. So, so it's a very high bar, very high bar. Yeah. Four people have to see that and be able to say it in the in the court that they saw it with their own eyes. Yeah. Which is yeah, I, you know, it's still barbaric. Doesn't change that, but it's a very high bar. Yeah. Um. And the, it, it has to be like uh, the relationship itself, like not even two men are too close or intimate. No, it has to be like sexual relationship. Um, there was a movie, I'm told based on actual events, it's called The uh, Stoning of Soraya something. Right, yeah. I, Have you heard of yeah, that? Yeah, I've watched it. Like that, you know, ago. that is the, the biblical law regarding stoning for a married woman who have uh, extramarital affairs and so on. Um, I have heard that that has been not being performed at all anymore for tens of years. Is that true? Right. It's still in there. Like, still there in the book. The law. And um, yeah, it's it's super unfair because um, according to law, if they want to like bury the woman to be stoned, they have to bury it up until the waist. But um, if they want to bury a man, they bury him up until like the um i don't know the the, the some part lower because mm-hmm. if you could somehow manage to escape the situation they cannot get you back and kill you so i don't know but i don't know why they make it harder for women but that being said yes they um they have like made up a reason for that and uh, it's also in the law that that if executing this law makes um makes Islam bad in other people's eyes. Like, if it's a bad image for us, then don't do it. And because of that law, it's not being done. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Well, we have come out of Stone Age, so to yeah, say. Yeah, it's... it's <laughs> Middle Ages and Dark yeah. Ages, yeah. yeah. So, well, we covered maybe 0.2% of the Iranian yeah. laws. Yeah, but, but I, I think, think... I think we have a good under, like a good basis. Yeah. And we are exactly one hour. So, well, thank you guys for watching. This was Essence of History. Today we talked about the laws in Iran. I'm Amanda Armagast. I'm Dr. Abbasi for Essence and our special guest. I'm Negin Keshavarzian. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, guys. Thank you.